Potato, potato, two potato, potato, two potato, three potato, potato, three potato, potato, four, five four, potato, six potato, five seven potato, potato, six, 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 Rent, pay up. Don't eat the co- the corn, the oats, the livestock. That's ours. When the butler blows the hunting horn, scarper. My carriage is coming through the town. We have purposed an underground passage for the servants, so as not to spoil the prospect. I say, who's that wretch stepping on the lawn? A woman said, "Maybe the stereotype of the Irish being thick is because you only had potatoes to eat, and the diet affected your intelligence." What drew me to the project of writing about the famine? It's very hard to say as a poet what things actually, how things start. But there was one point I know was really particular and significant. I was in the London Tube, and I saw this poster for an exhibition about Queen Victoria, a lovely portrait of her in her twenties, and it said, you know, the Queen, the Monarch, the Mother. And then across her forehead, someone had written, had scratched in graffiti. Irish famine, and I remember being so moved by that, and so taken by it, and just this thrill. And I looked round as if I could see who had done it, because I wanted to speak to them. And I felt like, what did Queen Victoria do during the famine? I didn't know. And I felt this sort of bolt of shame that I didn't know enough about the famine. And I thought I should do something about that. And then I thought, no, 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 it's far too depressing. I, I can't do it. I'm not strong enough emotionally. I don't really know where to start. And then a couple over the next couple of years, there were more and more boats arriving、um, over the Mediterranean and people drowning. And I felt this haunting of the coffin ships. And again, I felt I don't know enough about the coffin ships. How many were in them? Where did they go? 
how many survived, what state were they in when they got to Canada or America. So that was really motivated by the refugee crisis now. And then when I read that it was the biggest refugee crisis of the 19th century, I just thought, well, this is it. I have to do this book. Um, I'm uh, from Northern Ireland. I've lived in London for a terribly long time, like 40 years. I'm from a Protestant background, but I would say I'm a post-Protestant nationalist. Uh, so I've always been very invested in Irish heritage, culture, identity. And um, I guess my being drawn to the famine was through my mum telling me stories of people eating grass and seeing all the ruins. How could you not know about the famine growing up? They ate grass. You think you could never eat a cat or a rat, a dog, or chew an ember as if warmth was food. Ed Horgan, a carpenter fever crazed, tried to gnaw through a sod of turf. The donkey eaters won't shake that name. The dogs are eating our neighbours, the rats are at the eyes, the wheelbarrow man took her before she was quite dead. A couple came to the apothecary to sell the body of a seven-year-old boy. Knots unravel along the roads to the ports, Belongings in brown paper quartered by string. No one stops for the ditch's cargo. To have less than a bird makes you a stone. The fear of those without is different to the fear of those with. It's hard to guard and give at the same time. And I ended up at Strokestown, of course, and um, I remember being really moved by a lot of the exhibits and the video displays, but one of the things that really struck me was, I think it was in a vitrine and it was an inventory um, made by a school teacher in Gwydor in County Donegal in the 1840s, I think it was, and it was what people had among them. There were 4,000 people took part and they had one cart, one shovel, two forks. And to me, that those objects just really highlighted the extreme poverty of the people we were talking about even before the blight. And I just thought, this is so powerful. And it became a kind of running theme of the book where um, I ended up writing this book length poem about the famine and um, this idea of the inventory ran through it. The, the shovel became the, the, um, the works that they had to do to raise money. And the other thing that really struck me doing a tour of the house was this long hunting horn that is on, in, on the wall in one of the rooms. And, the guy doing the tour told us that when Major Machen was leaving the building, he got someone to go ahead on the horse and blow this horn and get all the poor and starving off the street so he didn't have to see it. And that to me was an extraordinary image of the willing blindness, the willing ignorance of the landlord. Um, and I really didn't know many of the stories about him, so I was very reliant on what I could find at Strokestown. And the other thing was um, a letter to him from one of his tenants, and she said, could I have a piece of meat for my children? And she signed it off, your miserable servant. And her voice stayed in my head. And then I found um, a Petty Sessions court where a woman had been fined for walking across Major Machen's lawn, i.e. the lawn in Strokestown. 
And to me, that was just absolutely horrendous, just imagining her barefoot probably going across that lawn and spoiling his view. And, you know, to be that extremely petty and vindictive um, to, to find her and put her through that. Map of resistance. Krishloch, some man shot at for picking mussels from the rocks. Monaghan, traps were laid, covered with brambles to catch cattle thieves. Petty Sessions, Strokestown, what possessed the defendant Catherine Larkin to walk across the lawn of Major Machen's estate? Major Machen's lawn, Strokestown domain. Too weak to walk the long way, my feet choose the smooth oval lawn of bright mown grass. Too angry to let the will of Machen make me bend, I cross before the big house. The printed step of blades blows silver in the sun, I've never had carpet under my soles, ladying my heels and toes. The softness of wool weaves springing up like the girl I was, married at 14. The petition for my wains in my hand, a small complement of flesh meat. Your most miserable, humble servant. I am beaten as an errant schoolboy slapped shape on my cheek, a common brand. I was very interested in the figure of Catherine Larkin because as well as the sort of horror of her being slapped and fined for walking on Major Machen's lawn, I wanted to give her a sort of beauty and dignity in her language and um, even in these extracts from the women in, in London you can hear a kind of dignity and an awareness of their situation and um, you know Catherine Larkin maybe ended up there for all we know. And we came to this country though I'd always heard it called a black country Sure, and there's much in it to endure. There's goings on in it, sir, that the praise God reward him wouldn't like to see. There's bad ways. I won't talk about them, and I'm sure you're too much of a gentleman to ask me. But if you know, Father, that shows you you are the best of gentlemen, sure. It was the eviction that brought us here. I don't know about where we was just, not in what county nor parish, I was so young when we left the land. I believe now I'm 19, perhaps only 18. I can't be more, I think, for sure, and it's only five or six years since we left Waterford and came to Bristol. I'm sure it was Waterford, and a beautiful place it is, and I know it was Bristol we come to. We walked all the long way to London. My parents died of the cholera, and I live with myself. But my aunt lodges me and sees to me. She sells in the streets too. I don't make seven pence a day. I may make six. There's a good many people I know is now selling in the streets because they was evicted in their own country. I suppose they had nowhere else to come to. I'm never out of a night. I sleep with my aunt and we keep to ourselves sure. I very seldom taste meat but perhaps I do oftener than before we was invicted. Glory be to God. There's an amazing portrait of an Irish fruit seller and um, I was struck by her incredible dignity and her, you know, really beautiful kind of shawl and cloak and she's puffing on a little uh, clay pipe. And just some of the images struck me as the eyes were incredibly dead in the images. Yeah, what struck me about that testimony of the flower seller or the street seller was how aware she was of her poverty. Um, it's a poor living when I see how others live. And um, you just think of the extraordinary luxury and entitlement that 
Queen Victoria would have been living in, not that far from where she was, walkable distance, and um, how little Queen Victoria gave to, to the Irish famine um, compared to other compensations she gave to people who'd lost their slaves, for example. So, yeah, the, the extremes of wealth and poverty, yeah, were extraordinary. Paperwork. It's over, said the English, and the Board of Works stopped, and another blight struck, and soup kitchens were delayed for months, and John Mitchell would say the Irish were slaughtered by stationery. Thanks, Queen Victoria, for your 2,000 quid cheque, and for your 8 million government loan, which had to be repaid. And not forgetting that in the 1830s you gave British slave owners in the West Indies compensation to the tune of 20 million. So here we are in central London in a street called Wild Court, which was one of the alleys where the Irish lived. And it's very near the area called the Rookery. It's in the centre of London, quite near Holborn Station and also Covent Garden, an area of high-end shops. And this was an area that was really packed with Irish immigrants. And uh, there was a curate of St. James in Piccadilly called Thomas Beams, who wrote uh, a piece in 1852, which was obviously just after the peak of the famine in 1847. And he says it, it was, you know, so startling to turn aside from streets whose shops teem with every luxury into this area full of squalid children, haggard men, mostly in rags, smoking, speaking Irish, women without shoes or stockings, wolfish looking dogs. I'm really struck by the contrast between what would have been Wild Court in the 1850s and places like Buckingham Palace and Pall Mall, which were only half a mile away. So I'm standing in front of what was the United Services Club where Major Mahan signed the notices to quit for his tenants, almost 1,500 of them, and he pledged to remove those who were the poorest and of the worst description. And uh, I think the, the last thing that I remember being significant, which tied in with the coffin ships, was Major Mahan paid a lot of his, his tenants to leave and um, they arrived in an absolutely dire state in, in Canada. A lot of them were very, very poorly dressed, almost naked. And they, they, I remember reading that someone was shocked that they'd come from his estate uh, in such you know, poor dress and they had to get blankets to cover them up to take them from the boats. So you, know, you need to understand the and generate the empathy underneath those vast numbers of deaths and migrations. And Strokestown was essential to that journey. The Coffin Ships, Canada. Timber in, humans out. 
Your landlord will pay your way. He'd rather breed cows. They mistake leaving for a choice. Desperation describes horror as good luck. Some on the landlord shilling left with nothing for 47 days and nights as floating captives aboard ships built for freight. Who cared if we arrived dead or alive? All in the bowling, Kitty is my darling. All in the bowling, the bowling hall. June thirtieth, battened in on a bad ship, or on this a rare good one brought up on deck for air, for a change of straw below, blankets shaken in any sun. We thought once the ship left shore we'd leave the land's sorrow, but find it under our nails, deep in our lungs, our gaunt search for green. We move through night and distance, fresh names are raised each morning by the sea's white furrow. All in the bowling, Kitty was my darling. All in the bowling, the bowling hole. August 7th, less than tatters is naked, too indecent to disembark at Gross Eel. Charity clads us, the government offers grub and a ticket home, too many for charity to bear. One doctor calls Major Machen criminal for wiping his estate of surplus in two chartered ships. Many died en route, never fit to travel. Many never left the fever sheds of Montreal. And of course, the end of my story with Strokestown was learning that Major Mahan was shot by two of his tenants in November 1847 and was actually the first landlord to be assassinated. And um, when I realised that that was part of a whole movement of freedom and independence, and it just felt like another history beginning at that point that we're still living through, really, aren't we? The white boys, the Fenians, a movement is also a shelter. Mm. Their permission, our punishment. Mm. Major Machen was shot dead by two mm. of his tenants in November 1847. Mm. Within weeks, seven more landlords were killed. Mm. Rent collectors mm. and land agents were assaulted. Mm. Can we say that the bad times ended when the troubles began. A woman at a London bus stop said, you animals murdering our boys. <laughs> <laughs>